Assalamu alaikum fam. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing our reading of Niccolo Machiavelli. Highly cool to read because he's such a huge figure. And so many people talk about him, but they only memorize one or two sentences of him. And, you know, they pretend like that's enough to really speak on who the man is as a figure of history or a writer and so on and so forth and that's not sufficient and so what we like to do on this channel is the deep dive into figures process and synthesize the information then give an honest weighted opinion because you can't trust people's opinions about things that they've never read that they've never studied and they think wikipedia and dr google is sufficient right or they just parrot what others said here we take the time to go through things word by word and then process it and see what wisdom we can detect in there okay so usually don't read the 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 notes in the chapter but there was some cool notes here that i think you'll find highly educational the first one is darius the first king of persia from 522 to 45 BCE, he created many stratopes, especially in the Greek city-states of Asia Minor and Hellespont. By emperors, Machiavelli means the Roman emperors, such as Septimius, Severus, who owed their throne to the army or the Praetorian Guard. Many of these emperors are discussed in chapter 19. Okay, so we're in chapter 7, so we got a while till we get to those figures. But Darius I, who was a king of Persia, then he contends that there was Septimius Severus, who kind of got his power due to the backs of the army. Okay, and then there's Francesco Sforza, and then Caesar Borgia. See 1476 to 1507 was the illegitimate son of Rodrigo Borgia, later Pope Alexander V.I. He negotiated the treaty in 1498 between his father and Louis XII of France that gave the latter a dispensation to marry the widow of Charles V.I.I.I. and got his support for the papacy's plan to conquer Naples. Now notice this. So the Borgia Popes are pretty famous, right? And we have here the illegitimate son of Rodrigo Borgia. Very nerdy, right? Wow, so much politics going on with the Pope. In exchange, Borgia was also given the Duchy of Valentinos in France. Hence, his name in Italy, Valentino. Oh, <laughs> look at that. That is strange. Duchy of Valentinois. Valentinois or Valentinois, I don't remember. And he gained the king's support for his conquest of the Romagna, which he undertook in 1501. So look at that. The Romagna, you have so much drama. Quickly subduing the towns of Fano, Pesaro, Remini, Senza, Forli, Faenza, and Imola. The next year, he conquered Camerino and Urbino for the Pope. Look at that. Look at that. So, the history of France in Italy is deeply tried to the position of the Catholics. I mean, Germany as well, and so on and so forth. But, man, it's so, like people complain about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, engaging in wars. Yeah, look at this. You know, literally the history of Italy cannot be separated from the Catholic positions of the popes. And later in that same year, he treacherously and brutally put down a rebellion at Singigalia of various lords in the district who had been joined by members of the Orsini, a powerful Roman family. Okay, so the Orsinis, remember, at this time, there's a lot of lords who can unite against the one who's above them and create a disturbance. So here it just says he put them down brutally. Like, okay, there's a rebellion of the elites. Smash. When Alexander died in 1503, however, 
Borgia's state crumbled, for he could not prevent the election of Guiliano de la Rovere, who was an inveterate enemy of the Borgias. Okay, so the Roveres, they did not like the Borgias. Drama. As Pope Julius II. Ah, okay. So, Giuliano de la Rovere, he became Pope Julius II. Very important facts there. And he suffered a series of misfortunes from then until his death in Spain in 1507. Remember, the Borgias were Spanish popes. Machiavelli met him several times on various diplomatic missions and studied his behavior closely. How cool is that, huh? So Machiavelli is not just somebody who sat in his Berkeley classroom, smelling his own farts, and raging about the orange man bad, and giving all these weird pseudo, you know, think tank ideas on, you know, different countries' affairs. Rather, he study these people in person that is like really at the seat of power really in that ring of power i mean to get around those kinds of popes right that's think about this this is the 15th century right it's not like he's hanging around you know with the fishermen drinking rum and thinking about what it would be like to be around these figures he literally was around them so he can give first-hand account he heard their complaints he felt their energy that came from them and then writes books that is pretty cool right very different than the very woke outraged people at the new york times who are like everybody's hitler everybody's hitler like very different very different awesome he idealizes borgia and the prince but does not distort his actions and then the next point here, the Orsini and the Colonna were longtime rival families of Rome. Okay, so the Colonna families and the Orsini, and remember how he said the Orsini and the Roveres and the Borgias, kind of all campaigning for power. Machiavelli discusses the difficulties the Pope had with them in chapter 9. Okay, and then Faenza was conquered on April 25th, 1501. Bologna was threatened that month, and the next, but never taken. And Urbino fell in June 1502. Florence bought by Borgia off by offering a stipend of 36,000 ducats a year, and thus maintained its independence, although it was supposedly under the protection of France. Whoa, that's trippy. So Florence paid to keep their independence, and there was a time when France in the 15th centuries aided Florence. Ha! <laughs> Go figure. Signor Paolo is Paolo Orsini, the head of the family, who swore allegiance to the Borgia on October 25th, 1502 at Imola on December 20th, no, December 31st at Singalia. The latter had Vitellozzo Vitelli and Oliverotto de Fermo strangled. What? <laughs> oh my gosh. Hold up, hold up. Signor Paolo of the Orsini family, he had his enemy Vitellozzo and Oliverotto strangled. <laughs> Jeez, what a brutal way to go. Oh my gosh. I'm telling you. 15th century politics, man. It's like you have AOC tweeting on Twitter. Eh, I'm scared. I'm oppressed. Crush the patriarchy. Meanwhile, 15th century politicians are strangling people. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, everybody knows Hillary Clinton got that body count, right? And on January 18th, 1503, at Castel de Pieve, the same fate befell Paolo Orsini at the Count of Gravino Orsini. Whoa, so he himself was also strangled. So he sent people to get strangled. And then he himself suffered the same fate. <laughs> Jeez. Crazy. Oh my gosh. Ramiro de Orco, or Ramiro de Lorca, to use his Spanish name, was Borges Mayordomo, 
appointed governor of the Romagna in 1501, he was brought before a civil tribunal presided over by Antonio del Monte that sat between October and November 1502. Ramiro's decapitated body was found in the square of Senza on December 26th of that year. Note that Machiavelli does not specify in this passage what the two pieces of Romero's body were. Whoa. Wow. So he was a governor. Whoa, dude. Wow. He was brought for civil tribunal in February by 21 de la Okay, so Ramiro de Lorca and also Ramiro de Orca has two names. His body was decapitated and it was found in the square of Senza. Wow. Do you see? Wow. These politicians is crazy back then, man. 15th century politics, like I've been saying. They were like, okay, we'll put you in the public square and we'll make an example of your corpse. I mean, wow. Jeez, man. Hooey. You know? It's really fascinating just to see how politics was done back then. The people didn't play, you know? I guess you could say to now politicians have their secret hit squads. You know, they have their secret ways of doing it, sending in a small force. They don't do public displays as much anymore. They do it kind of behind the scenes. But it just really is shocking sometimes, like how they're just very deliberate, you know? Perugia was conquered on January 6th, 1503, and Piombino on September 3rd, 1501. So, wow. Piombino and Perugia, they're conquered. There's so much drama going on in Italy. Pisa placed itself under his control on February 1503. It had depended on the French to maintain its independence of Florence, and when the Spanish dislodged the French from Naples... And the Pisans could no longer depend on them. They turned to the Borgia instead. Aha. So the Borgias, not only were they Pope figures, but they also bent the Pisans to their authority. Once they got the French out of uh, Naples through the Spanish aid. Because the Borgias were themselves Spanish. Wow. Machiavelli's Italian for won over or destroyed is guadagnare o perdere. This second verb can also be translated as lost, which seems to complement one over better than destroyed. However, in Machiavelli's thought, the true alternative to the prince's winning of people's allegiance is not to lose them, that is, to leave them indifferent, but to destroy them so that they are no longer a potential danger to him. Aha! Okay. Guardagnare o perdere. So, one over, better than destroyed. Okay, so here you get a, there's a Spanish saying called plomo o plata, which is like gunpowder or silver, or like gunpowder or platinum, steel or gold. Like, there's an expression, like, do you want to be won over through arms or through, you know, refineries of gold? The cartels, the narcos, Pablo Escobar, those types, would say these kinds of phrases. So here, there's an Italian phrase which is similar. You're either going to be won over or you're going to be destroyed. Right? Or lost, either way. But this aspect of make the people indifferent to your authority or destroy them so they're no longer a threat. <laughs> uh, you know... This is really fascinating because the Founding Fathers saw the drama of the Confederacies, the city-states, and not having a union, right? And so they saw how the churches were having this tit-for-tat of power, that there was, you know, a huge force behind the papal throne, right? So when they wrote their essays about how you could organize a government, they had this type of history in the back of their mind because their libraries were advanced. They were very well read. It's not like today where we have politicians. I mean, even Ronald Reagan was an actor. Trump was an actor. 
I mean, one of the leaders of Ukraine was an actor. Arnold Schwarzenegger, a bodybuilder actor, was the governor of California. It's not like today where we have the, you know, buffoons, celebrities types ruling and, you know, really being puppets of whoever's behind them telling them how to rule. But here you see that they wanted something different, the founding followers, where it was like, we have to watch these factions that rise up and have a test for power at the negligence of the people. But then you can also see Machiavelli's point is that during this time, this is what had to be done, they felt, to secure power, to secure and survive. It really sounds like, you know, either you win or you lose, and if you lose, that's the end of you. You either gain an alliance, you, you know, or you bend the knee, or you become fish food. It's really quite telling, isn't it? Very nerdy. I really like that. That's why it's so beneficial to read these things. Machiavelli was sent by Florence to Rome for the papal conclave that lasted from October to December 1503. It initially elected Alessandro Piccolomini as Pius III, who died on October 18, just 10 days after being chosen, and then elected Borgia's enemy, Giuliano della Rovere, as Julius II. So look at that. There was a papal conclave, and Alessandro, he just got elected. He's Pius III. And then he dies <laughs> like 10 days after becoming the Pope. Think about that. Allah is the best of planners. You get excited. Oh, I'm in the seat of power. I have become this position. And then, bam, you, you go back to Allah. You know? I mean, they're Catholic, so it's not the same. But still, what my point is, is that you get, you never, nothing's guaranteed, man. Only death is guaranteed. And then, you know, Julius II comes and he's our Rovere and they don't really like the Borgias. So how the tables turn. How they turn. The four cardinals whom Borgia had injured were respectively Giuliano della Rovere, who later became Julius II, Giovanni Colonna, Raffaello Reario, and Asciano Sforza, Ruin was Georges D'Ambios, the advisor to Louis XII of France. Well, the four cardinals who Borges injured. So he has these four cardinal enemies. Wow. It's like he's got some drama going on. He's got some drama going on. We totally learned a lot. Those notes were totally worth reading. Very nerdy. Adds an extra layer to our understanding of what is occurring at the time that Machiavelli is writing? Understanding the context, getting to know who he is as a person. He has first-hand account of these figures. He's not just a woke tard on his laptop, right? He's actually somebody who has perceived this and then created a thoughtful and laid out analysis in many ways that will drop some wisdom for us readers. Very nerdy. Have a good day.